We're gonna swim, bike and run In the corner sun We're gonna swim, bike and run In the corner sun 2021 Thank you, Poncho Man. Welcome, everybody. Breakfast with Bob, not quite Kona edition. My name is Bob Babbitt. We are brought to you by Hoka One One, by Credo Tri, Challenge North America, Amp Human Velo Fix, Four Seasons Hawala Lai, Norma Tech, Form Goggles, You Can, Canyon Bikes, and of course, our Challenge Athletes Foundation. Right before COVID hit, we sent out 3,921 grants, totaling $5.9 million to keep challenged athletes in the game of life through sport. Our next guest, the CEO of USA Triathlon, Mr. Rocky Harris, joins us. Rocky, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty well, Bob. Thank you. Appreciate it. When I look at the highlights of 2020, and there are not a hell of a lot of them, one of them to me was Endurance Exchange. I thought bringing, for years, we had had a race director conference, and we had a coaches conference, and we had the tribe business conference, and you guys brought it all together under one roof and brought the whole world of triathlon together. And uh, I, I thought it was phenomenal bringing all these bright minds together to talk about the sport. Talk a little bit about bringing that together and what you were surprised with from that. Yeah, I think when you know Dan at Triathlon Business International and I first started talking about what, what, what needed to be done in our sport to, to help it grow and to help us come together, it was really taking uh, all of our you know fragmented and segmented parts of our sport and bringing them together and being more collaborative and creating partnerships. So what we did with uh, at the time was we decided like let's stop having all these different conferences. It's unfair to our constituents. Race directors have to go to multiple conferences, coaches club directors. So let's bring it all together under one roof and let's have one amazing conference that everyone can come to. So when we created Endurance Exchange, it was to do just that. It was to take, I think, three or four of our conferences and the Triathlon Business International Conference and bring them together. And the result was was beyond what we expected. We had over 600 uh, people register, paid registered uh, guests that came. And, and what I thought was the best part about it wasn't just that we had such a big group. It was that when we went there, the wind was at our back for the first time in maybe five or six years in our sport. We were seeing growth across the board, and we felt like 2020 was going to be our year for our sport. So it was really like when I look back at the year, although that seems like it was two or three years ago now, even though it was yeah, in January, uh, it, it is for us, uh, to me, that one of the defining moments of the year. And I think it was just, it showed how much our community needed to get together and how much that's really benefited us this year. Many of the conversations we had there are things that we ended up still doing this year that we always said we didn't have time for. We didn't have time to advance this or that. Well, we spent this year advancing many of those initiatives that we heard from our community at that event were really important to them. So how has this pandemic affected you? I mean, you look at your, your business is people racing. It's race directors putting out events, people participating, paying for one day licenses or annual licenses, and pretty much all of that went away this year. How have you guys adapted to this? Yeah, it, you know, we were down about $8 million in revenue this year, um, and that's significant, right? And, oh, yeah. Um, you know, but we're, we're no different than uh, a, a local race director or club director. Everyone in our sport is, is being impacted in, in significant ways. So we, we really had to go into a cost cutting exercise. We essentially didn't spend any money this year. We, we uh, have 30% less staff now than we did at the start of the year. Um, we've sold our building. We've listed it and we're selling it to liquidate some of our assets to pay and continue to cover our cash flow. So it was significant, right? But it, it, it pales in comparison, I think, to, again, the people's livelihoods in our sport that were really directly impacted across the entire country. So what I try to impart on athletes in particular, which I'm one of them is be really patient with your race directors, be really patient with people. They're doing their best. They're just trying to keep the lights on. They're trying to feed their families. This is not like they're trying to do anything other than that. They love our sport. That's why they do it. They don't do it for money. And so I just want to make sure that everybody gives them the benefit of the doubt and does everything they can to support them through this very, very difficult time. You know, I've always told people the most important link in the chain is our race director. Everything, Absolutely. everything comes from that. If we don't, when I had Competitor Magazine, if the events were doing well in Southern California, that led to retailers doing well. If the retailers doing well, the manufacturers look at that region as a hot region and they invested in the region. So everything starts with those race directors. And, you know, I've had probably six or seven resumes come across my desk of 
from race directors who are leaving the business because they don't know what's going to happen. We don't know if we'll have events until May, June, that you're in touch with all these folks as well. What are you saying? Yeah, same thing. And, and I couldn't agree more, Bob. The most important uh, group in our sport for the, for the long-term sustainability of our sport is race directors. And, and so if they don't produce uh, kick-ass races that people want to compete in, um, we don't have a sport. Uh, and, and that's part of the byproduct of how the sport was set up, right? The sport was set up as a racing sport. I think over time, we have to diversify that a bit and spread it out. And the clubs are doing a great job doing that. Our coaches are, our local communities, our race directors are doing a great job diversifying their businesses. Mm -hmm. So a lot of like when you have a crisis like we had this year, it actually either you, 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 you fold and you, you, you just move away because it's just too much for you or you innovate and you try new things and you, you grow, you end up advancing the sport. And I feel like our, uh, our sport has really been fractured this year in many ways. But I will say this, Bob, this is the exciting part is we're seeing demand like we've never seen it before. Uh, you know, Iron Man just announced they sold out all their long distance events. Um, we're seeing events pop up and, and the demand is incredible. So we're all hungry to race. I know I've done uh, a few ultra marathons this year and a bunch of trail races. Um, many of my friends have done triathlons this year. So people are still racing, but it's on a very small level and it's community based. It's based on what community you live in. So our job and what we have focused on this year is providing all the resources and tools, bringing experts together to help race directors create the safest races possible for athletes. Because I've said this and I found this out through medical experts from the USOPC to, again, across the world, the best in, in the business. Our races are as safe as, as any event you can do. They're outdoors. Um, you know, we 99% of our races, you don't draft in them. There's time trial starts. It's, there's just so many things that make our races safe. The problem is traveling to races and this, everything around the races. So we're really, we created a campaign recently that's race locally, race local, compete nationally. And it's all about racing in your neighborhood, racing in your community, signing up for those races now, supporting those local race directors. Even if it's not your A race, it's really important that if you're going to race, that you at least race locally first, get your, you know, get that, get, make sure that you're, you're confident in the race and then, and then travel. Um, that's what we're really pushing. And so what we also did, Bob, is we created the return to multi-sport guideline initiatives for race mm -hmm. directors, for athletes. Um, and we've been working with local organizers, city uh, managers across the country to show them that our events can be safe. Now it's all up to the athlete if they want to do it. And I, I've been saying this all year, like I would race tomorrow. That's me. Right. Um, but my wife wouldn't, right. She wouldn't want to wait till things are different till the vaccine's fully implemented. Everyone's different. So what we're trying to do, because we know events will happen. We know athletes will race that we have to create as safe as an environment as possible for them. And that's what we feel like we've done this year. And we're really proud of that. And it's not us at USA triathlon. We're not the ones doing this. We're bringing together the experts, the race directors, right. the medical experts, um, disease specialists, CDC guidelines. We're bringing it all together and we're helping create these guidelines based off experts, not just us saying this is how you do it from Colorado Springs. What was interesting is a couple of weeks ago, I was down at Challenge Daytona, which USA Triathlon was part of that event. Incredibly successful. Race the sprint triathlon. And I mean, everything from registration was you know, socially distant, everybody in masks. Uh, they, when you came into the racetrack, you had temperature checks. They actually, for all the pros and all, all the rest of us who were there for a number of days, we did COVID tests and on race day, we had, you know, you're thinking, okay, how am I going to get to the, from the bike racks, which were socially distant. There's only three people on each side of the rack. And then we walked down to the swim start. You're going, well, I'm not going to wear a bandana and it's going to drag me down in the water. They had masks for you to walk to the start. Then you threw the mask away right before you jumped in with three other people. So our sport, I think, is, is, is when you talk about a 20,000 person marathon, that's tough. When you're talking about our sport with 1,000 people or 1,500 people, I think it's totally doable. But I think a lot of the cities are making it, well, in the states are making it very, very difficult for anybody to put on any events at this point. You're right, Bob. And we, we've seen that the, the states that have, have, have opened up again, they don't open up to every event like indoor gym events are much different than outdoor triathlons. Right. Right. And so the ones that are actually trying to open up the businesses in an appropriate and safe way, it, they're the ones that are really open to our sport. And, and we've already had over we had over 500 events during the pandemic, 500 races across the country. So they're happening and they're happening safely. And we 
uh, have not found one case of COVID that spread or any type of, uh, uh, th at any of our events. We had one volunteer who, who ended up getting COVID, but it wasn't related to the event. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's been, so far we've seen that it's been, it's been safe. Now we know it's not hundred percent foolproof or safe um, because that's just a matter of this pandemic and this, uh, you know, the, the coronavirus is something that you can't fully uh, protect from, but that's, that's many things in life. So again, what we're trying to do, Bob, is 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 work with those local communities, and we're we're seeing now many, or even though we're going through a pretty tough period right now, we are seeing cities way more open now than they were even three months ago. They now know a vaccine's coming, and they want events back in their town, and they believe our events are the safest events they can put on because of what we've talked about. So we will be the first events in many cities um, because of that. What's fascinating to me is you think about what the best prevention for COVID is, is to be healthy. I think if, if there's one thing that came out of all of this is people are now going, what's more important than my health, which is why Peloton. And I mean, all these people who are training indoors now, they will be in our corrals in the next few years. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind. These are, if there's any positive that's come out of this is people are aware that fitness is really important and I want to do events because it's going to keep me healthy. Plus, you know, for people who over the last few years maybe got a little spoiled and thought, oh, I'll do that event next year. Who knows if it's going to be there next year? You better do it now because you never know. Yeah, and I think that, you know, we, we do have a great opportunity here. That's one thing that, that we are looking at. Again, the silver lining of, of this terrible situation is more people are not only uh, being fit and, and getting on bikes, but they want to be outdoors. And our sport is so like we are the perfect sport. We are the perfect sport for a pandemic because of that. And so we're not only going to uh, do uh, focus and this takes everybody, athlete to athlete, race directors, us, coaches, clubs of recruiting your friends who, you know, picked up a bike this year, who, you know, who's going out for hikes. And that's how you recruit them to our sport to create this lifelong health, healthy, you know, uh, experience that they can have for the rest of their lives not just this year because they went through a, a serious thing where they were on lockdown. This needs to become a part of their life. And what's even more exciting is we're seeing a ton of athletes come back to our sport. So yes. people who were busy, people who had lots of things happen in their lives. They re, they, they re-engage with the sport. I've gotten beyond hundreds and hundreds of emails from people saying, I'm back. I'm back to the sport. I, I fell back in love with it. And so that, that's also been a positive out of this really tough experience. So our job at USA Triathlon and really everyone's job who loves the sport and wants to see their communities healthier is to spread the good word, is to get people out there, connect them to us, uh, go to mytimetotry.com for beginner resources. Um, we're put, we've rolled out a campaign this year, Bob, called uh, Power Within. And it's all about telling stories to inspire people to become triathletes and it's to reposition our sport from one that feels unattainable to some because of the 10 hour races to show them that they can race, you know, if they can, again, swim across a pool and, and ride a bike and, and, and jog or walk, they can do a triathlon and be triathletes. And we're really going to push that message to everybody because anyone, anyone can be a triathlete. My mom has leukemia. She's had two knees replaced. And she did our virtual triathlon this year, right? Yes, she walked. Yes, she got on a spin bike and she swam across the pool very slowly on her back, <laughs> but she did one and she considers herself a triathlete now. And we have to shed this, this barrier that we've created that's made our sport so awesome. Like it's helped, it helped me come to the sport. So we don't want to lose that part of our sport either, but we want to add layers to our brand and not make it just this unattainable, fast, you know, expensive equipment. We want to also show that anyone can be a triathlete and it, does, it doesn't have to be an either or scenario. It's both. And our sport is, is way too good to have to focus on only one thing. We can create a very competitive environment and we can create an open environment and accessible environment for everyone to, to, to welcome everyone in. It's funny because our sport over the years, it's you, people know about it because they watch it out of the NBC show, right? And they see Dave Scott and Mark Allen and all these folks. They think it's a, it's an elitist type of sport, but what's really helped put us on the map wasn't the top guys. It was Julie Moss crawling across the finish line. It was Dick and Rick Hoyt, what a father would do for his son. And right now, obviously Nick Nickich, what Nick has done being the first down syndrome athlete to, to finish. Incredible, Ironman. incredible but story. It, it, it's taking those stories and making people realize you don't have to do an Ironman. You can do a pool try with the bike that you've got in the garage with cobwebs on it. 
right? And with a, with a pool swim and with a 5K run, and you are a triathlete, you're part of our tribe. And if that's all you ever do, we're fine with that. We don't need you to do an, an Ironman. You can be doing a shirt. Now that to me is one of the issues we had before COVID is people had become, uh, it was all about getting that signature event. They, they want to become an Ironman. Get the MDOT and leave. And they, I don't think that's sustainable for us. We need people to come in, do sprint, do Olympic, and stay in our sport because it is, it, it is a fountain of youth and you can, you can do it forever. To me, that is what our message is. Absolutely. And that's, that's exactly what Power Within is all about is, show, is showing those stories, telling those stories, communicating those compelling human interest stories that show that anyone, if, I mean, Chris is a little stud that's been just like, he worked his tail off. He earned everything he got. He didn't just like walk in there. But for a young man to, with Down syndrome to be the first to complete, a, 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 I mean, a significant race for anybody shows that, that if you put, if you put the effort into it, you can accomplish anything. And our sport's a great way to do that at whatever level you're at. And I really think the next step for our sport, Bob, is exactly what you said, is it's not the one and dones. It's not focusing on athletes who want to check something off a list because that hurts coaches too, by the way. They lose Absolutely. that. The retention numbers go down. It hurts clubs too because all of a sudden they're missing right after the big race. They have 20% down or 30% down from what they had the week before. And it's, it's, so it's just really hurting our business. And I think long-term what we have to do is we have to also diversify the disciplines and formats. And this is going to be a real focus for us. I think that while triathlon is always going to be our core sport or anchor sport, we have to look at swim runs. We have to do a better job with aqua bike. And what I want to do is rebrand and reframe those disciplines and formats, because right now, you know, most people don't even know what a duathlon is, but if you go to somebody and say, would you want to do a run bike run? They go, heck yeah, I do. Like, that's awesome. But if you say duathlon, they go, what does that mean? Right? So I think we have to do a better job and that will, you know what that'll do? That'll open it up. That'll open up our sport and be way more accessible. We've done a terrible job at this as a sport. We focused on our core product and haven't diversified at all. If you're looking at it from a business perspective, right, for the sport overall. So where are, our, yeah, we're going to continue to grow 5% a year in triathlon. There's no doubt about it. Um, we, if we want to grow 20, 30%, we need to diversify. We need, and the reason why is the younger generation, more than even my generation or yours, they want something different every year. They don't only want like my I wanted to go to a different race location and have a race vacation, right? A racecation. That was my different experience every year. They want to try a duathlon this year, a, a, a trail, uh, uh, maybe, a, you know, a, a trail run one year. They want, they want to just do everything different. And we have to be able to offer everything and promote everything and make it really easy to connect to it. And we also have to do a really good job when there are trends. Like I, you know, I ride, you know, probably 40, 50 miles on my gravel bike a week, right? I love gravel bike, you know, and I know Dan and others have been pushing gravel tries, but why didn't we a few years ago, just get behind that and say, look, let, we know people are buying gravel bikes. Let's make that just a part of what we do as a sport and make that one of our many formats. So I think that we also, in addition to looking at short course, looking at pool triathlons, looking at women's triathlons, that's where we've seen significant growth over the last few years. We also need to diversify the disciplines and that will bring people of all backgrounds into our sport. What's fascinating, if you look at the late 80s, early 90s, we had the Coors Light Duathlon Series. We had the Desert Princess Duathlon and they sold out. These were big because you think about it, you don't have the swim thing to worry about. I think when we went from calling it biathlon to duathlon, it'd be, I don't want to be a duathlete. And it's like the name made a huge difference. And all of a sudden, all of that went away. Yep. And, but again, the, 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 the fact that it's so accessible because everybody's got a bike and everybody can run. Every event could have a, a run, bike, run added to it. So, you know, what I've seen with race directors have been successful like cause events out here in Southern California, mm -hmm. when they have the, the event, the main triathlon, they add a duathlon, they add an aqua bike, they add a kid's event. They just fill up the donut hole. You've got the, you've got the roads blocked off Add is and make it a festival. And that I think is exactly what we saw, at, to be honest, what we saw at Daytona and why that was so successful because you had so many options for people. Yeah. So the growth in our sport, uh, again, pre pandemic was all about exactly what you just said. It was about, Take, we already, we had many events around the country and many race directors would say we have too many events, but we didn't have enough events that were multi-sport festivals. 
that were bringing people together. And, and we saw this in 2017, right when I came, I t- what I did is I called our 20 top race directors and started asking them questions. What's working for you? What's not working? And across the board, the ones who saw growth did exactly what you said. They diversified their events and created opportunities from people of all backgrounds to compete in many different disciplines. Because like you said, the ro- they've already paid the, the, the expenses to, to close roads and all the other things. So that's where the growth came. As we started spreading that around the country, we talked to race directors and said, hey, have you thought about adding a do- Athlon. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? This has really worked in, in Philadelphia. This has really worked in Sa- San Diego with Carrie and Cause Events and et cetera. And I think that that's where we really stepped in. It wasn't us telling everyone what to do. It was us showing and sharing best practices. But I think when it comes to changing and, and promoting the formats and, and disciplines of our sport, we at USA Triathlon really have to take a leadership role and rethink it and start over almost. Because to have like 20 or 30,000 do athletes and like 400,000 triathletes, there's, there's a gap there, right? That, that, that I, it'll never get to 400,000, but why can't it be 60,000? Why can't we have 50,000 swim run athletes? Why can't like that? That's the way I look at our sport growing. Mm-hmm. And that's a way I can easily recruit people to come do one of those events. Who's not comfortable in one of the disciplines. And then we, and then over time, they want more, they want a little more. So they start coming to swim practice with me, right? And then, and then, and that's how this sport works is you always want a little more, even if it's not moving up in distance, you just want a little more because it's addictive because it's so damn great. Well, it's one of the funniest things we were doing when we were doing the breakfast show from, from Daytona, you know, behind me was this racetrack, right? This huge monstrosity with, and I'm looking at it going, this is a triathlon festival for an entire week with rock concerts and duathlons and bike races. And, and when, when, uh, uh, when Bill Christie's talking about Challenge Daytona and now Challenge Miami and then Watkins Glen and potentially uh, something on the West Coast and going to 12 different stadiums, from your perspective, you're going, OK, wait a second. No roads are blocked off. Everything is totally contained. You can race at night that is like the perfect playground for triathlon, don't you think? It sure is. And, and what, what else I love about, you know, the, a NASCAR series, let's say, is yeah. who knows how to create a better experience than NASCAR, right? If, if, if an on-site experience, a festival experience, when I went to NASCAR events, it was to see the race, but it was really to have a few beers and enjoy myself, right? Yeah. And so the, the creating the experience around the experience, wh- where our sport also can grow in addition to creating, you know, re-energizing the formats and disciplines and promoting them better is to create fans and spectators of our sport and not just participants. Right now, what I love about our sport is we're a participatory sport. In America, though, we're not, a, we don't have a huge fan base that's not, not participating. Yeah. We don't have people just spectating at races. And I think that we have to do a really good, a good job of that. And I think NASCAR and, and having on sites like that, a controlled environment where you can see the race from one location, those are elements that you can use to grow fans. And so I'm, I'm really excited about what, what they're doing. And really, there's a lot of innovative ideas around our country right now uh, where people are coming up just like Bill Christie at, at Daytona and many others. They're, they're looking at how do we create controls uh, around the events and how do we create better experiences for not only the participants, because we've always thought about that. How do we create it for their families, for everyone else who will come out and attend the event so they fall in love with our sport, even if they don't feel like they can ever become an athlete? Because over time, and like I've always said, once you get a bite of the app, once you taste it, you start falling, you start, you just want, again, you just want a little more. And so that's, that's all we have to do is introduce our sport to as many people, whether they're fans, whether they're watching a broadcast, whether they're engaging with us on digital, whether they're racing, we need to start creating fans of the sport. And that's how we'll really see it grow. If we want to see it grow significantly, we have to create a broadcast product that cr- puts the revenue in place for our lead athletes, for the sport, for local race, for everybody. Because once it, when I've worked in other sports, as you know, Bob, in the NFL and major league yeah. soccer and college athletics, everything was driven by the broadcast relationships. If you have that, if you can create a good product, the money change, the whole, like the sponsors for local race, everything changes. And that's what we have to do as a national governing body, working with Ironman, working with PTO, working with Super League, working with all the players in the sport and bring them together under one umbrella and say, how can we help at USA Triathlon? Because we don't want to be a media company. We want to help them be as successful as they can be at what they do. We're not looking to make money. Our job is to grow the sport, is not to generate a bottom line. And so that's, that's why we're kind of this unique, we're kind of Switzerland on this, we don't really have, we have all the skin in the game, but we don't have any monetary gain out of it. 
other than seeing the sport grow, which is awesome for everybody. Well, and, and having, it's funny because we, we doing the show from down there, we did like 58 interviews and we're talking, you know, Sebastian Keenley and the Brownlee brothers and the, you know, the numbers in terms of viewership numbers, you know, we had like over two and a half million minutes of viewing over that week. And, and what, what you'll love, Rocky, when I look at our demos from YouTube, our number one demographic was 25 to 34. It was watching the show. Love watching it. it. Love it. Love it. Right. Yes. And that's that's what we're talking about. We don't need me watching it. We don't need some. They already old- got us, Bob. We're hooked. Yeah, no, we, we need <laughs> some people going, I want to know more about Vincent Luis. I want to know more about these young up and comers, Ben Canute, right? And that and then doing seven hours of live. And I don't know if you've caught much of the live. It was oh, yeah. spectacular. Oh, yeah. I, I watched every minute of it. Yeah. Right. And then uh, January. Yeah, I'm missing the sport as much as anyone, Bob. If you show me anything triathlon, I'm watching it right now. <laughs> yeah, it was it was really cool. And that was really eye opening to me because these were Kona like numbers that we had from Challenge Daytona in, you know, in December. So it really showed me that our athletes do resonate, that people do want to watch what they are when they are when there's a million dollars on the line or if there was one hundred thousand on the line. I think people still would have been watching because it was great athletes going head to head at a distance that no one had ever done before. There was something cool about that. It Let's really talk was a little bit about, about endurance exchange. Number two, January 21st, to 23rd, uh, this year virtual. So you get another challenge, but sometimes with these virtual things, it's sort of cool because you can bring the big four together without having them leave their house. They don't have to travel. They don't have to do any of that type of stuff. So talk a little bit about, you got a Paolo Ono as your keynote. Uh, again, race directors, coaches, clubs, Everybody can come. I'm doing a Q&A with, with uh, Gwen Jorgensen and talk a little about uh, what your hopes are for new endurance exchange. Yeah. So, you know, there are uh, some some benefits of going virtual. And like you said, you know, people don't have to spend money on traveling. Um, we I think actually I've been a part of many conferences over the last six, seven months. And the content sharing is actually better at, through a virtual. You can get more content out there than you can because you don't have to, you know, shift between locations and the, the one thing that's really missing, though, is the ability to network and get together. And that's one of the real benefits of conferences. So that will be missed. And we're we're trying to accommodate that. But quite frankly, that's that's a challenge. But from a pure information sharing, best practices, all that, it's going to be better than ever. We actually have, you know, over uh, 70 different tracks and uh, in, in, uh, sessions that we way more than double we had last year. So the content's going to be amazing. We have a new medical track too, where there's going to be medical, um, which is really going to be helpful for Mm -hmm. coaches and everyone really involved. We also did something new this year and it also allowed us to charge about less than half of what we charged in the past. So just the expense is in a really tough year. It's one of the benefits of going virtual. We also created an athlete track, which my vision for endurance exchange over the course of time is for it to become not only for the endurance industry and for all the constituents but for athletes to go there and and that 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 will over time make the expo huge and create a race around the the endurance exchange for athletes to go to so we created an athlete track this year that's fifty dollars where you can see most of the general sessions and that's something that we're really trying to promote to our general membership Um, it allow athletes now who've never been allowed able to participate uh, to be able to want to be a part of it to learn from the best, to hear about some different coaching and nutrition advice, et cetera. And, and so we're excited about the growth of the athlete track uh, in the future as well. And endurance for people to get tickets. Yes. Go there and, and, and register. And um, you know, we're really happy with the numbers so far and pretty surprised by them, but January is always our, the month where most people sign up and register. Um, yeah. But yeah, be a part of this. I mean, it's supporting, you know, the multi-sport community, but also when, what, what I found is, and I, and I, and most people know this about me, I love attending every single session if I can, um, but we will record the session. If you attend, you'll get a recording of it so you can watch the ones you missed. Um, so there's, what we're trying to do is this is about uh, making sure that we start 2021 with a fresh start with fresh ideas and bring the entire sport together from race directors, coaches, clubs that always attend. Um, to now medical personnel are going to be attending and athletes. So we're adding those layers this year. And we're really excited about that. I love it. And NCAA, right. I, I know with NCAA is facing their own issues, right. Where they're cutting other sports. How is that going to affect with, with what you guys are doing with NCAA and triathlon? 
Yeah, you know, that's I, I my when before I joined USA Triathlon, I was chief operating officer at Arizona State University in the athletics department. And we were at the time we were one of the few uh, power five division one programs adding sports. When I was there, we added women's triathlon. We added hockey. Um, we added lacrosse. We added men's tennis. Um, we added uh, beach volleyball. So we were actually adding sports. When, and at the time, that was unheard of. And what we've seen this year, uh, and luckily my, my alma mater in ASU is not doing this, in Division I, over 100 programs have been cut. Tennis, swimming, mini programs. Division II and 300s have been cut too. The USA Triathlon, we're so proud. Um, during the pandemic, we've had five new programs added, five new ones added. We've had six this year in 2020. And that's really like just us and Tim Yon, our, our chief sport development officer, just maintaining those relationships, showing the value in our sport, showing that the, the, if you have the, the CapEx inf inf infrastructure in place, if you have a pool, it's about the least expensive sport you could ever possibly add. And plus the, the demographic of our, our participants and potential donors for the university and our, our athletes at that level are all A students. They're amazing students. So they actually, it just lifts the athletic department up and the university up to add triathlon. And so we're, we're, we're thrilled with what we accomplished this year in the middle of a pandemic and adding five programs. Uh, I would have never guessed that on March 11th when we knew that our world was going to change. With you've got the, the university teams, but you also have clubs, right? At which you know, Cal Berkeley, 150 members. To me, those are the folks who are going to fill up our corrals, right? More so, that I, I, NCAA is great. But I also think that the clubs, can you do both? Can you, knowing yes. that your dollars are cut? Yeah, absolutely. We, we can, uh, we can chew and, you know, walk, uh, walk and chew gum at the same time. I always say we definitely can. And we've invested a ton in our collegiate club programs um, and, and more time and resources. It's something that we actually spend more time with our collegiate clubs than we do our NCAA programs because of what you said there at, at that level, they're really the heart and soul of the sport at the college level. Without our collegiate clubs, kids will leave the sport and may never come back. Exactly. We see a huge cliff at age 18, right? It goes like this from our membership, boom. And then it picks back up at 23, 24, when they leave college, start making a little more money, they start coming back. So one of the things that we heard from our collegiate clubs is, you know, the, again, cost is always an issue. So we're rolling out new membership types in Q1 of next year. And one of them will be, um, we're, and this has not been announced yet, but I'll do it right here, I guess, is that we're going to decrease pricing for 18 to 24 year olds. We're going to, we're going to make it, uh, I think $35 instead of 50. So they're graduating to become a, a full member by the time they're 25 um, and not have, and again, it's just lessening the burden a little bit. Again, across the board, it's a, it's a big loss for us. But we believe we have to do everything we can to eliminate any barriers, especially for that age group. The more kids we can get in that age group, that's the that that's the, the and, future. And that, that's cool. the cool group. That's what who everyone wants to be a part of and be. And so, if I'm here and there's a 22 year old in our office and intern, and they're talking about what they're doing, I want to hear about it. No one wants to hear what I'm doing, right? No. I'm past I'm past that. <laughs> and so that's what we have to do to really grow our sport because they're the biggest influencers. And we have to do everything we can to eliminate those barriers. And I really think that we have to start pushing people to our collegiate clubs. We have to start promoting them. We have to start helping them fundraise too and create a programs for them to be sustainable. We have to, like I, I did a duathlon in 2019, I think, um, in San Antonio, the, 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 the club program there put it on, they raised 20 or $30,000 from the duathlon. And I was just so impressed. I wanted to go race in it. So my, my wife and I and my family uh, flew out there on our own dime and yeah. went and raced in it. Because And so we just need to do a better job at, at continuing to make sure that they're sustainable for the long term, um, that yeah. they have people like Dean, you know, at, at, at Cal oh. Berkeley. So it's all about the people. You know, if you have a good leader of a program, if it's not if it's not only student led, if it's somebody on the outside who cares. So any certified coaches here, um, which we have 2,300, so there's a lot of them. If you have a local uh, college in your area, I would highly suggest you go to them and start a club program with a student. Find a student there and you work together to start a club program. It's really important to the future growth of our sport. My favorite event of the year is they have USA Triathlon does, and they USA, um, UCSD as the Triton Man Triathlon. And they, they put on a draft legal and the whole bit, but they also have an age group race. And seriously, it's 95% 29 and under. 
Yeah, I'll be out there and like four people go by me and their combined ages don't add up to me. And that, that's like my, my favorite thing. But watching these, cl- these clubs from Berkeley, from UCLA, from UCSD, and they get together be, right before the race starts and they're doing the big cheers and a whole bit. I'm like, this is our future. It this sure is, is like and two, a couple of years ago on the 40th anniversary of, of Ironman, I actually had Gordon Haller in town. And so I brought Gordon to do Triton Man. And all these kids were going out of their minds that they met the first ever Ironman champion. It was it was really two eras together was was pretty fun. But that that to me, those clubs are that's our future. And it I, really is. I'm yeah, and we're excited to, uh, to see them grow. And we believe that they actually will grow um, in a big way over the next five or six years. And it's not again because we're doing everything right. It's that we're seeing that the younger demographic, that younger group is really starting to get reinterested and reintroduced into our sport. There was about a 10 year gap that we lost that younger generation for whatever reason. Yep. And, and I'm not, there's no one to blame. It's just the reality of it. We're seeing them come back now and we have to do everything we can. Again, my job is to remove, remove barriers to our sport, to try to work with the community, to, to give every kid the opportunity like they did it, you know, the Triton man, right? Like that's what it takes. And this generation really loves short and fast right now. That's what we're seeing Ooh. from them. They want to go, they want to do little super sprints. They actually want to do things that like just allow them to go out with their friends and, and do something for an hour. And then they go back to their normal lives. And so they're, they're not going to commit right now, 15, 20 hours of racing or, or of training, excuse me, to go race. So we, again, uh, the diversity of events that we talked about earlier are critical to grabbing this group and making them a part of what we want to accomplish over the next 20 years. So one other thing, I think we're going to have, we're, we'll definitely have an Olympics and we'll definitely have a Paralympics and there's too much money at stake not to. And I think for the sport of triathlon, we saw what happened when we had the first ever triathlon in the Olympics in Sydney in 2000. This mixed relay that's going to be showcased on NBC during the, we'll have two triathlons on, we'll have the, the, our regular Olympic distance race and the mixed relay. And for people who have not seen the mixed relay, I think it's going to help infuse even more excitement for the sport when this thing airs you've seen some of these mixed relays well what, what are your thoughts on it I, I love it i absolutely agree with you in every way that it's great for tv too it's a great tv okay. product to have two men and two women competing from every country uh at, you know against each other it really allows things to to be equalized across the board right and what we're seeing is that obviously we're we we got a silver medal at the world championship this year okay. yes there was a world championship this year and our athletes competed in it um, so we're, we're, we're primed and ready to, to, to make our country proud and to represent America and, and win a medal. And what I love about that is it, it represents so, so many good parts of our sport, right? Gender equity has been at the root of our sport from the very beginning, that our sport is evolving and changing all the time, that now we have this mixed relay that we believe that the next, uh, it'll end up, uh, the next Olympic edition will be a short court, short, short course race, um, where, you know, it's about, again, short and fast. So we're seeing this as the not the future of our sport overall, but the future of the Olympic part of our sport and seeing it get really short and fast is so good for TV. And that will get people introduced to our sport and the compelling storylines of like, you know, seeing like this athlete go a little slower. And then we see the next athlete uh, in that maybe in the male category go faster and catch up. It's like the excitement. And I'm running around during these events when I'm at them. I'm losing my mind during the mixed relay. It's that exciting. Like I'm literally running from part to part to watch every single part of it because it, every single, the tactical and the strategic parts of a short course race like that, where you're in a relay, there's nothing like it I've seen in our sport. Every second counts. Every moment counts. It's so much different than most of our other races where you can make a mistake and still be in it. You can't make a mistake in this one. Not at all. No, it's going to be great. And I think we're going to see just like we saw USA triathlon numbers just skyrocketed after Sydney. And I think we're going to see the same thing again with our sport and more excitement and more people wanting to be involved. Again, we got the Endurance Exchange coming up January 21st to 23rd, endurancexchange.com. You'll have race directors, coaches, medical, clubs. Everybody will be together. Rocky, every time we chat, you pump me up, my man. I, I get I love our sport and all we both want is for more and more people to find out that we have this, the secret event, the secret sport that's not so secret that will change your life forever and make you better at everything you do in life. So getting a chance to chat with you is, is always a pleasure. Thanks so much for, for taking time. Absolutely, Bob. Thanks for all you do for our sport. It's, it's uh, obviously you've spent your career in it, but 
Um, you know, without you, uh, we're a not the same sport. We're not even close to it. So it takes all of us. And I think what, what your experience over the last 40 plus years in our sport shows is that you can get involved at any time and you can make a huge impact like you have. Um, and, and so that's what I want people that are listening to know is that, you know, while, while Bob and I are, are maybe higher profile in our sport, what I love about our sport is it's still in its infancy. It still has, we are at the very bottom of where we're going to be. We're going to continue to grow. And I do want to make our sport a mainstream sport. And I believe that we can do that. While it's fun to have our little community here, it's not that little, but, uh, you know, little community. Um, Bob and I uh, believe firmly that it, because our sport helps make communities and individuals healthier, that we are going to keep being in e evangelicals for this. We're going to evangelize for it. We're going to be advocates. We're going to do everything we can to get it in front of as many people. But it can't be just us. We need everybody to do the same thing. So thanks for everyone for listening. Um, and please, as always, Bob, and you know I do this, feel free to reach out to me directly if you have any questions, any concerns. Um, I'm rocky.harris at usatriathlon.org. I might not be able to answer them, but I will find an answer for you. Um, so thanks again, Bob. Really appreciate it. Rocky Harris, again, has been our guest. This is Breakfast with Bob, the Not Quite Kona edition. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll catch you next time.